Good morning, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and it's my privilege to welcome you to online worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, we're continuing our journey through the season of Easter, and today is the sixth Sunday of Easter. And it's my prayer that during worship, you will encounter the living Christ and be drawn deeper into the love of Christ. Let's go to God together in prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for this time of worship. We thank you that we can gather together wherever we may be uh, in, in, to worship and to praise your name. And Lord, today especially, we give you thanks for Christ and for his great love. And so pour your Holy Spirit upon us as we worship and praise your name. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in the prayer for illumination, which will be printed on your screen. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The gospel lesson this morning is John 14, 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, my name is Fernie, and I'm one of the pastors here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. I am so excited to get to share the word with you today. So there's a story of uh, an elderly couple. They, um, they were lying in bed. They were about to go to bed, and uh, the wife looks over at her husband, and she says, Honey, do you remember when uh, we were falling asleep and you used to sleep really close to me? And the husband, he's a little uh, annoyed, right? And he takes a deep breath. <sighs> and he gets closer to her. So they're laying down for a couple of minutes and then the wife looks over to her husband again and says, honey, do you remember when you used to hold my hand as we were falling asleep? He begins to grumble under his breath. <sighs> and he reaches out and holds her hand. A couple more minutes go by and uh, she looks to her husband again and says, honey, remember when you used to nibble on my ear and tell me you loved me? At this point, the husband, this elderly husband, lets go of her hand and begins to inch towards the edge of the bed. And as he's getting up, she says, what's wrong? Where are you going? He looks at her and says, I'm, I'm headed to get my, my teeth so I can come back and nibble on your ears and tell you I love you. I read this story earlier this week and I just couldn't get it out of my mind. It's such a beautiful story. I can imagine how annoyed he may have been, right? He just wants to get to bed. He's already gotten ready to sleep. He has to get back up. But I love this story because in the middle of it, he chooses to love his wife. He chooses to inch a little bit closer to her. He inches to reach out for her hand. He chooses to get up. He chooses to love her. I've been thinking about that a lot recently. What does it mean to choose to love someone? What does it mean to choose to uh, sacrifice and, and love someone? And as I was wrestling with that question, I started thinking about the scripture in 1 Corinthians. Choosing to love someone means we choose to be patient. Choosing to love someone means that we choose to be kind. We choose to not be arrogant. We choose to not be irritated. We choose to bear with all things, to hope all things, to endure through all things. 
You know, I think that's a very accurate representation of what it means to choose to love someone. It means we sacrifice. It means we put our needs aside. It means that, that uh, we, we're willing to, to put the work and the effort. Choosing to love someone requires work. A couple of weeks ago, a family friend of ours passed away from COVID. And uh, as news of that uh, began to spread, his family started posting stories of him on Facebook. Stories of, uh, you know, their favorite memories. And one of them, one of my favorite stories that, that I read was from his son. He said that on the night that he, uh, the day that he was getting married, he started, uh, he, he and his dad went aside and they started having a conversation. And his dad said to him, uh, you know, what, what are you worried about? What are you excited about? And his son said, dad, what is it going to take for me to have a long-lasting marriage as happy as yours and mom's? He said in that moment, his dad looked at him and said, son, it's going to take work. You're going to have to choose to love your wife. You're going to have to choose to give up certain things. You're going to have to choose to uh, make the commitment to put in the work every single day. You know, I've been thinking about that story. I've been thinking about our scripture in Corinthians. And, and I can't help but think of the fact that choosing to love Jesus is probably just as hard, if not harder. Choosing to love Jesus requires a lot out of us. It requires commitment. It requires work. It requires kindness. It requires that we persevere through all things. Choosing to love Jesus requires us to let go of habits that pull us away from God. Choosing to love Jesus requires a lot out of us. Which begs me to wonder, why should we choose to love Jesus? If choosing to love Jesus is so hard and requires so much out of us, why should we choose to love Jesus? In the scripture that was read today, I think we can find an answer to that question, but I've got to be honest, I've really been wrestling with this text. I've really had a hard time wrestling with this text all week. See, the scripture begins by Jesus telling his disciples, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. Right? If you love me, you will follow me. You will uh, uh, long to be more like me. And then Jesus goes into this list. If you love me, you will follow my commandments. And then you will receive the Holy Spirit. I won't leave you orphaned. You will see me. You will live just as I live. And you will be loved by God the Father. Jesus is preaching, is teaching to his disciples, and he says, if you love me, you will receive these things. But I have a hard time with that because it almost feels like Jesus is offering perks in exchange for our love. It almost feels like if we don't dive uh, deep into this text, it feels like Jesus is bribing me, bribing us to love him by offering us certain things, by offering us perks. See, a perk is something special that only certain people get. And I think that's why that, this, this whole text makes me a little bit uncomfortable and I've been wrestling with it so much. Perks mean that you are offered something that not any, everybody can receive, right? The, the reserved parking spot at work, the extra days of vacation, uh, the, I don't know, the, the VIP pass to the backstage, right, where you can meet the band. Perks are something that only a small group of people can receive, when I was in high school, I worked as a waiter at the country club. And I, I was a, it was a lot of fun. Most of my basketball teammates worked with me and uh, a lot of my classmates worked with me. And um, it was a lot of fun, but we didn't work every single day. Like I said, most of us were athletes and most of us were very involved at school. So we were brought in whenever there was, whenever there was a big event. So normally if it was a corporate event, we would be called in because it was a lot of people. But in particular, we were brought in when club members were having an event. See, if a club member was having an event, we had to roll out the red carpet. We had to help decorate the, 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 the building. We had to polish all the silverware. We had to get the good linens. We had to wear the good uh, um, vest and aprons, right? Uh, when, the, when club members had an event, 
we had to uh, have one waiter for every table. At most, maybe we would have two tables. And if any of you have ever waited tables, you know it's not that hard to wait on one table. But part of that was that we needed to make sure that if a club member had an event, uh, nobody's cup would go empty, nobody's plate would sit there too long. We, you know, being a club member came with special perks. Now, I want to be clear about something. There is nothing wrong with being a club member. I know that if I could have a, a membership to the city club, I would go all the time. There's nothing wrong with being a club member. There's nothing wrong with having a VIP pass. There's nothing wrong with these things. But I also want to be clear about this. I don't think Christianity comes with perks. I don't think an invitation uh, to love Jesus, an invitation into Christianity is about getting certain things that other people uh, don't have access to. I don't think we're called to become Christians in order to receive certain perks. Because let's be honest, all of us have struggled with COVID and the implications of COVID and the struggles with COVID. Christian or not, we have all been affected by this. Christian or not, we've all experienced some financial struggles or strains or fears. Being a Christian, choosing to love Jesus doesn't give us a free pass from things. Being a Christian, we still experience death and fear and worry and anxiety and sorrow. Choosing to love Jesus doesn't come with special perks in which we don't have to deal with certain things. See, at the country club, being a member meant your cup would never run dry. As a Christian, our cup may run dry. We're going to face struggles. Life will happen. See, I've been wrestling with this text over and over again because I struggle with the idea that maybe Jesus is offering us perks in order uh, uh, for us to love him. But as I've wrestled with it more and more, I think... I think Jesus isn't offering a perk. I think Jesus is offering an assurance. See, I think Jesus is saying, there's nothing special. (laughs) You're not going to receive special things just for choosing to love me, but you will have an assurance when you choose to love me. You see, I think Jesus says to his disciples, when you choose to love me, the whole world is going to criticize you. But you will have an advocate that is there with you. I think Jesus says to his disciples, when you choose to love me, the whole world is going to turn their back against you because you're going to leave so many things behind because people are going to think that you have changed and that you uh, don't care about them anymore. They're going to say all these things about you. The world will turn its back against you. And Jesus says to them, when you choose to love me, I won't leave you orphaned. I think Jesus says to his disciples, when you choose to love me, at times it's not going to make any sense. But you will still know me. I think Jesus says to his disciples, if you choose to love me, you're going to have to let go of some things. And you might feel like you're letting go of the things that bring you happiness and peace and hope and joy. But trust me, you will still experience life when you choose to love me. I think what Jesus is saying to his disciples is, if you choose to love me, the world might stop loving you. But I will still love you. See, Jesus isn't offering perks in exchange for our loves. Jesus is offering an assurance for when we choose to love him. If choosing to love Jesus requires so much out of us, the first question we'll have is then, well, why should we do it? I think the reason we do it is because we have this assurance that no matter how hard it will get, 
Jesus will be faithful in our lives. I have a friend I met a couple years ago, and he has always been a Christian for as long as I've known him. But when I first met him, he was uh, nominally connected. He would come whenever he felt like it, and he would uh, be involved with the church leadership whenever he had time for it. And as I got to know him more and more, I could tell that he was giving his life more and more to Jesus. The person I know today is nothing compared to the person I met years ago. So as I was working through this sermon, I sent him a text message and I asked him this question. I said, I'm preaching about how choosing to love God requires us to sacrifice a huge part of who we are and who we want to be. I said, let me ask you, why did you choose to love God and sacrifice so much? Here was his response. I was so sick of doing the same old things. I love our friends, but I I was tired of it. They always wanted to go out and do stuff all the time, and it usually involved drinking, and usually drinking way too much. But when I was at the end of my rope, and my daughter was about six months old, I found that I was still trying to keep up with them, and I wasn't finding happiness anymore. I knew I didn't want to keep living life like that, And I remember several times thinking to myself that I say I'm a Christian, but I really don't act any differently from my friends who say they are atheists. So I started asking myself, do I really believe in God? This is the part that really struck me. He said, once I actually decided I wanted to give faith a chance, I began to see that this new type of life God was offering was worth it. See, choosing to love Jesus requires so much out of us. It's hard work. It takes commitment. It means that we leave certain things behind. It means that we uh, let go of things, trusting that what Jesus offers is so much better. And while I can't say anything to convince you, all I can say is that we have this assurance that when we choose to love Jesus, no matter how difficult the journey may get, we have an assurance that it will be okay, that it will be worth it. Will you choose to love Jesus today and tomorrow and every day? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. God, wherever we are, whatever we're struggling with, whatever life has thrown at us, It can be so scary to choose to love you because we know that choosing to love you requires so much. But God, I pray that we may be filled with this assurance, the same assurance you gave your disciples so that in everything we do, we may choose to love you. God, I pray this in your most precious and most glorious name. Amen. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I know that uh, worshiping via a screen uh, through technology is not how we were hoping to be worshiping together. But I want to thank you uh, for the intentionality that it took to sit and to sing with us and to pray with us and to uh, read scripture with us. I hope that uh, as you gather today, you were able to catch a glimpse of God, uh, specifically a glimpse of God's love for you. And I pray that that may bring an assurance to you so that you may choose to love Jesus every single day. Go forth in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.